Welcome to Buckner's Web Roundtable, Compliance Strategies to Address the FBI College Basketball Fraud Investigation. My name is Michael Buckner. I am an attorney and serve as president of Buckner and will serve as the co-presenter for today's program. Before we begin, let's review some housekeeping items. First, this program is being recorded. You can view the video of this webinar as well as any other Buckner online workshop on our website, bucknersportslaw.com, or our YouTube channel, which you can search by using Michael Buckner Law. Second, you received earlier this week the pre-roundtable packet. You will receive a link to the program materials in an email that will be sent immediately after the program. The email mm -hmm. also will contain links to the PowerPoint presentation, mm -hmm an evaluation form, which I encourage you to complete so we can continue to improve our webinar offerings, and a request for a referral, for referral page in which you can elect to provide contact information for persons who you feel will benefit from our services. Email me at mbuckner at bucknersportsall.com if you did not receive the materials. Third, your phones will be muted during the webinar. Fourth, we will have a question and answer session during three portions of the webinar. The first session will occur approximately 20 minutes into the program. The second chance will occur at approximately 40 minutes into the webinar. And a final opportunity will be conducted at the end of the webinar. If you would, if you would like to ask a question, email those questions to me at mbuckner at bucknersportslaw.com. I will answer as many questions as time permits. Finally, if you cannot see the PowerPoint slides through the Meeting Burner webinar system, exit the system, and when you log back into Meeting Burner, be sure to download the screen sharing app indicated on the screen. The objectives for today's program is to discuss numerous techniques to proactively minimize mm -hmm. liability regarding fraud and corruption in college sports, and in particular, mm -hmm. men's basketball. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our co-presenter of today's program, Frank Lopez. Frank Lopez is a shareholder with Glade, Vuk, Lord, and Smith. His practice focuses on employment law, sports law, internal investigations, compliance, business crimes, regulatory matters, and complex civil litigation, including class action litigation. Frank is a former mm -hmm. assistant United States attorney, deputy district attorney, U.S. Equal uh, Employment Opportunity Commission senior trial attorney, and has served as in-house counsel to Fortune 500 companies. Frank is well-versed in all aspects of civil and criminal litigation. He has tried more than 50 cases to verdict and has personally handled numerous depositions, evidentiary hearings, mediations, and settlement conferences. Frank has mm -hmm. also experienced in handling investigations before the NCAA, including proceedings before the NCAA Committee on Infractions, and is a zealous, zealous advocate for coaches and players alike. Frank has counseled uh, and represented numerous, um, numerous uh, individuals, uh, in regarding employment disputes, internal investigations, executive agreements, non-compete agreements, and severance agreements. Currently, Frank serves as a compliance monitor pursuant to a U.S. Federal District Court consent decree. Frank, welcome and thank you for your time today. And Michael, thank you for uh, that very kind introduction. And I should say uh, right up front that uh, the little that I know about NCA compliance, I learned from my uh, good friend Michael Buckner, um, who is a real expert. And uh, so I look forward to uh, speaking with you all and, and hopefully uh, um, answering some of your questions. Well, thank you again, Frank, for, for joining us today. Our program today focuses on the federal fraud and, corp uh, and corruption investigation in college basketball. Let me summarize what we know thus far. Mm -hmm. According to, to a September 2017 Business Insider article, the FBI arrested 10 people in charge of fraud and corruption in men's college basketball on September 26, 2017. The Department of Justice announced that assistant coaches at Arizona, Auburn, USC, and Oklahoma State have been arrested along with managers, financial advisors, and representatives of the international sportswear company Adidas. Jim Gatto, the director of global sports marketing for basketball at Adidas, was among the defendants. Gatto is accused of conspiring with coaches to pay high school athletes to play at universities sponsored by Adidas. The investigation, which had been in progress since 2015, was led by the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District, for the Southern District of New York. Three separate complaints have been filed. 
Gather and four of the defendants have been charged with making and concealing bribe payments to high school student athletes and or their families. In one instance, Gatto and the other defendants are accused of funneling $100,000 to the family of a high school basketball player to persuade the player to sign with a public research university in the state of Kentucky. An undercover agent investigating the case said Gatto told other defendants that the payment was on the books at Adidas, but not on the books for what it's actually for. The complaint doesn't name the university, but based on details provided, it's most likely the University of Louisville, which signed a $160 million sponsorship deal with Adidas in August. In another case, Gatto and the other defendants are accused of agreeing to make payments of up, up, up to $150,000 from Adidas to persuade a player to join another team sponsored by the apparel company, according to filings. The university is not named, but based on all the information provided, it's most likely the University of Miami, which entered a 12-year partnership with Adidas in 2015. Again, I'm reading from an uh, article from Business Insider. Other defendants include Jonathan Brad Augustine, the president of the nonprofit The League Initiative, Merle Code, a former Nike employee currently linked to Adidas, and Christian Dawkins, a former sports agent who was, who was reportedly fired in May after being found to have charged $42,000 in Uber rides on an NBA player's credit card. Gatto and other defendants are accused of using a, a, a parent uh, uh, payments to the nonprofit as a way to conceal bribes paid to players and their families. The assistant coaches named as defendants in the cases are Anthony Bland of USC, Chuck Connors, a person of Auburn, Lamont Evans of Oklahoma State, and Emmanuel Richardson of Arizona. The coaches allegedly took bribes from financial advisors and business managers in exchange for pressuring student athletes to hire mm -hmm. individuals. The multi-million dollar battle for top-tier college basketball teams is hard fought among sportswear giants. The visibility of high-profile teams and players is a valuable marketing opportunity for apparel companies even though NCAA players themselves cannot be paid to endorse brands. Again, I'm reading a summary from the Business Insider, an uh, uh, online publication that uh, published an article summarizing what we know thus far in late September. So with that, Frank, due to your background as a federal prosecutor uh, and with that summary that we know about what's going on, Please provide us your insights on what happens when the FBI investigates an allegation, what typically happens after criminal complaints are announced, and what can, what can we expect as a membership in the future as the feds prosecute the, uh, the defendants? Well, Michael, thanks again, and I appreciate everyone's participation today. Um, let's emphasize something, though, as we continue down the path, as Michael's observed. Uh, we're talking about allegations. and. In the United States, uh, fortunately, the presumption of innocence still, still applies. But um, from what we've read uh, through media accounts and heard um, on the news and so forth, these are very serious allegations, and I'd suggest that this is uh, a watershed moment. Um, what we know from reported accounts is that the FBI used a cooperating witness, and that is an individual that was under investigation for a wholly unrelated matter um, who got caught up with uh, an MCA, or rather an SEC inquiry and an FBI inquiry, and uh, because of some alleged financial improprieties, allegedly a Ponzi scheme, uh, he decided to uh, try to save his own scalp and begin to cooperate. And that's very common in federal investigations, federal investigations I've been involved with. Um, and um, so from the standpoint of this being a watershed moment, I would anticipate that we would see more of this activity. And so what makes uh, FBI investigations unique um, is obviously the vast resources uh, that literally enables them to reach uh, investigations and targets across the globe. And so what um, kind of leading up to this, um, by and large, most of the work has been done. And so they leverage various resources to collect information. I've already referenced cooperating witnesses. Um, obviously, uh, there was uh, some surreptitious uh, recording here using the cooperating witnesses. We haven't heard about, uh, at least I have not heard about wiretaps, um, uh, but that's another technique, uh, both physical and electronic surveillance, uh, search warrants, and significantly grand jury subpoenas. Uh, leading up to this process, typically what happens, my experience was the FBI agent would uh, come knock on your door and say, hey, I've got a potential matter to pursue that I'd like to talk through with you. And the federal prosecutor takes a very active role, if you will, in developing the investigation. 
uh, because at the end of the day, they're the ones that are going to take the case uh, to and uh, through trial. And so um, after meeting with the FBI agent, it's not uncommon for the um, Assistant United States Attorney to leverage the sitting grand jury. In every jurisdiction, there's a grand jury that sits uh, for at least 18 months, and those are the individuals that meet on a periodic basis in bigger cities like New York. Uh, they meet weekly in other jurisdictions. Um, they meet uh, less frequently, but they hear evidence in the form of testimony from agents, and it's all, frankly, very one-sided. Uh, they have the power at the request of the Assistant U.S. Attorney to issue grand jury subpoenas and to compel testimony and documents uh, and other tangible evidence to further develop uh, the case and uh, prepare it for prosecution. The process is very secretive by design, and it's to uh, both protect the integrity of the process and uh, witnesses and, and so forth uh, to help protect them from reprisal and the like. Um, but that's um, kind of the background, the wind-up to a uh, prosecution. And at some point, the federal prosecutors satisfied they have enough evidence to go in and get a conviction. Uh, we're talking well beyond the probable cause standard for an arrest uh, by the point that either a criminal complaint or obviously an indictment, which is returned by a grand jury, and it is a specific finding of probable cause, um, prosecutors uh, reach for and focus on, can I prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt before they even charge it? And so uh, when you see a charge um, from a federal prosecutor's office, it's very serious. Uh, what I'd also add is that this particular office, uh, Southern District of New York, is one of the premier offices that leads the way oftentimes in prosecutions. And um, it's not uncommon for other federal prosecutor offices to catch on and pursue similar um, investigations, if you will. And then also, um, both state attorneys generals and DAs also have similar authority and uh, believe it or not can essentially prosecute for the same conduct because they're vindicating uh, state interests versus the federal interest pursued and vindicated by the federal prosecutor. But just quickly to wrap up, once the charge has been brought either in the form of a criminal complaint as occurred in this particular case or a grand jury indictment, then the case winds itself through the process after the individual's arrested. Uh, there's bond hearings, there's pretrial hearings, and then uh, very likely some sort of a suppression hearing where the uh, accused seeks to challenge um, the legality in which uh, evidence was collected by the government uh, contending that it uh, violated the law and more specifically uh, the federal constitution. Um, it culminates um, in, in, in theory, in a trial. In practice, most cases are resolved via plea bargain. That's because the system is structured in such a way to encourage, if frankly not forced, uh, criminal defendants to plead. Um, among other things, uh, there are incentives in the form of, uh, under the sentencing guidelines, acceptance of re responsibility credits and the like that um, you don't get if you go to trial and get convicted and then ultimately um, sentencing. So that's a, you know, an overview of uh, the process. As I said at the outset, it's a watershed moment because, again, um, I would anticipate, as I've seen in other areas, you'll see other federal U.S. attorneys' offices, uh, that um, there are multiple offices across, uh, in, in within each, uh, particularly the larger states and across the country, there's at least an office in each state, and then you have state attorneys generals, and then you have uh, DAs who uh, look at their uh, big brother, if you will, federal prosecutors, and um, again, under state law, can charge uh, for offenses that, uh, uh, that are uh, akin to what we're seeing here. Uh, so Mike, I'll uh, turn back over to you. Yeah, uh, Frank, I appreciate that. Uh, Frank, let me just ask you one question. Um, uh, generally, if, uh, hopefully, uh, none of the universities on this call receive a phone call from the FBI, but if the FBI or uh, U.S. Attorney's Office in their particular jurisdiction uh, calls uh, one of the universities on our call, what would be your recommendation as to how a university should respond uh, to, to that inquiry from either the FBI or the U.S. Attorney's Office? Well, and, and, and I'm sure um, uh, you would recommend the same, Michael, and that is obviously the first call is to the University General Counsel's Office 
if uh, the university does not have general counsel um, and there is uh, counsel with whom they are familiar, uh, that should be the first call because it is a very perilous uh, situation. Um, obviously, the NCA has great authority um, to sanction universities, but the, the Department of Justice has the ability to incarcerate individuals. And so right from the outset, you want to make sure that um, you're properly preserving evidence uh, so that you can't be accused of uh, destruction of evidence or obstruction and the like. And you also want to make sure um, that you're taking um, you know, the right steps to uh, protect uh, the university and uh, their staff's interests. Thanks, Frank. I appreciate it. And if anyone has any questions for us, uh, please email those questions to me at mbuckner at bucknersportslaw.com. That's mbuckner at bucknersportslaw.com. And we will start our first question and answer session. I'll see whether or not we have any questions in the queue. Okay, we do not. Uh, so remember, if you have any questions, please email them to me at mbuckner at bucknersportslaw.com, and I will address those questions. Either Frank or I will address those questions during our second question and answer session. Let's proceed with our program. Now we will explore best practices and strategies colleges and universities can evaluate uh, as to address the issues identified in the federal investigation and prosecution. Our approach in this program, in this part of the program, will be twofold. I will begin to re I will review an enhanced traditional NCA compliance approach, and then uh, Frank will follow up with and review ideas from the corporate compliance world that can be adopted by NCA institutions in light of what has, has transpired with the FBI investigation. I will begin. In preparing for today's program, I reached out to coaches and professionals in the field to solicit their thoughts and ideas on what really has gone on in the last few weeks. Coaches informed me that the fraud and corruption described by the federal government last month has been going on for a long time. I was informed that the core of this issue is born out of relationships, the relationships between coaches and agents and student athletes and agents and the relationships between universities and their apparel companies. Some of the coaches told me that the federal probe may momentarily stop kids and their parents and family from seeking handouts, but the problem will not go away long term. One coach informed me that high-profile athletes do not care which school that they attend. Uh, from their viewpoint, high-profile athletes think that you know, NCAA, high profile NCAA schools are all about showcasing their talents and that um, a high level school is a high level school and that they only seek something in return. And I was informed that high profile athletes will be looking to receive something from a school that is recruiting them. And so coaches have to face uh, using their own money, uh, finding an agent that can take care of the athlete or some other form so that you can take care of high-level high athletes. And those are some of the really frank comments that I received from some of the individuals that I, I reached out to. Well, what is a high-profile athlete that is identified in my summary? Well, we identify a high-profile athlete as a blue-chip student athlete um, who is a one-and-done basketball student athlete someone who's a prospect who is listed on one, of the, one or more of the National Recruiting Service rankings, a student athlete who generates significant attention from professional scouts, agents, runners, sports marketers, and or professional teams. Uh, a high pro athlete can also be a student athlete who is projected to be a finalist for or has already earned a major national athletics award. He can be a student athlete who is projected to be selected in a low round of a professional sports league draft or an athlete with an academic and and or, or and or athletics history that cannot be verified through a cursory evaluation. Now we're dealing with third parties as well in this in this investigation. And those third parties are any person who maintains either or directs others to maintain contact with a prospective or role student athlete, the prospects of student athletes' relatives or legal guardians, or coaches at any point during the prospects of student athletes' participation in athletics and whose contact is directly or indirectly related to the prospects or enrolled student athletes, athletic skills, and abilities. And so some examples are, as we're learning in this investigation, and as those on the call already know, sports agents, apparel company representatives, street agents, sports marketers, financial advisors, runners, um, boosters, high school coaches, AU amateur club coaches, all can be third parties as we're going to be talking about uh, uh, during this program. 
essentially what I've gathered from talking with coaches and, and professionals and, and doing our through our own experience investigating and providing compliance um, advice to uh, colleges and universities, um, what we gathered the uh, the key in, in all this is the head coach. And as we know in Division One, there's bylaw uh, 11111, head coach control. Um, and you know, based on my conversation with with coaches, um, the head coaches know. The head coaches know exactly what or should know exactly all the things going going on, especially dealing with the high high profile athletes. And so, one of the things that that, that we recommend is, is is talking to the coaches, having an ongoing uh, ongoing dialogue with your coaches, asking them about about the relationships. Um, uh, asking them what, what are some of the issues that, that are out there. Do, do a little bit more proactive um, uh, conversation with the coaches on these issues so that you can get ahead of those issues. We, we, we think that developing a high-profile student-athlete due diligence program, which conducts uh, with, the, with that such a program, you would be conducting a comprehensive audit of high-profile prospective student-athletes on their financial, relationship, and other issues. So it's more than just going beyond what you would normally do in an initial eligibility review and going beyond what the NCAA Eligibility Center does. But you're really, for these high profile, these few athletes that, that, uh, that may be under scrutiny, you're, you're looking at, uh, you know, where or not they have any relationships. Of course, they're going to have relationships with, with these third parties, but, but uh, looking at um, uh, different financial and other holdings that uh, they or their family may have. Because the money money's being funneled somewhere, and so that's going to show up somewhere. That's going to show up either in property, that's going to show up in, in vehicles, that's going to show up in uh, funds and bank accounts. It's going to show up somewhere. And so doing, doing uh, some due diligence uh, on that part will not only uh, help uh, minimize the liability, but also will put everyone on notice uh, that, that the university is, is watching. Uh, great an objective set of criteria to identify high-profile student-athletes. And I just mentioned some of what we consider to be high-profile athletes. Um, implement the, implement uh, uh, several registration and monitoring activities, including uh, a sports agent uh, advisor program, uh, student-athlete vehicle registration program, uh, student-athlete and parental housing registration program, and student-athlete employment program. All these programs, in terms of you want to make sure that, that you're tracking exactly what your student athletes are doing, what the parents um, may, may be acquiring. Uh, you know, one of the uh, some of the things, if some of these programs have been implemented, uh, could have could have uh, raised red flags uh, that could have been that could have prevented some of these issues at some, some of the schools. Increased monitoring activities uh, in various areas, including athletic facilities, sidelines, uh, or other limited access areas to an athletic contest and team charter trans transportation. Monitor social network and other internet sites uh, that, might, uh, that might provide uh, necessary intelligence for you as you're looking at, again, it's all about relationships. Create a daily Google search alert for compliance related news on, on, on identifying uh, high profile student athletes. Again, uh, making sure that you're collecting as much intelligence as, as possible on these high profile athletes so you get ahead of the head of the issues. Follow reports of high school student-athletes attending parties or other social gatherings hosted or organized by professional athletes, corporations, sports agents, runners, sports marketers, financial planners, or investment advisors. Require student-athletes to read and sign a statement acknowledging receipt and understanding of legislation and institutional policy concerning sports agents, amateurism, and extra benefits. Schedule mandatory rules education sessions for student-athletes, coaches, and staff on issues relating to sports agents, um, uh, amateurism and extra, and extra benefit legislation. Address issues relating to sports agents, amateurism and extra benefits during at least one student athlete advisory committee meeting each academic year. Include questions relating to sports agents, runners, sports marketers, uh, apparel company reps, financial planners, um, and, and your exit meetings with transferring student athletes or seniors, and an annual student athlete survey. Again, this, this ongoing theme about trying to collect as much data as possible so you can find out as compliance administrators and athletic administrators and university professionals about what's going on on your campus. And so where you, where you collect all this information? Well, we recommend you develop in a database or obtain access to already established databases to where you can, have, you can put all this information in. 
Uh, so you can put in, uh, you know, if you find information about sports agents or runners and sports marketers and apparel company reps uh, so that you can um, uh, uh, access that information when you have questions. Uh, provide student athletes, uh, parents, and guardians with a summary of NCA legislation and institutional policy concerning sports agents, uh, amateurism, and, and extra benefit legislation. Uh, create an anonymous hotline to receive uh, allegations, tips, questions, or other information concerning illicit activity by those third parties. And uh, also address sports agents, runners, sports marketers, financial planners, and other third parties in regular rules compliance audits. And finally, include this topic in regular uh, meetings with your head coach as you're going through talk about head coach control, making sure that this is also addressed so that, and making sure that the head coaches are addressing it with members of, of their staff. Those are just some of the uh, recommendations that we have uh, developed uh, over the past uh, uh, week or so after talking with coaches and, and professionals in the industry. We'll be providing these recommendations and, and more uh, in our uh, post-webinar uh, handouts, which you should receive uh, within the next 24 hours. We're going to start with our second question and answer session. Again, if you have any questions for us, please email those to me at mbuckner at bucknersportslaw.com. That's mbuckner at bucknersportslaw.com. There are no questions. Uh, so if you have any questions uh, for either Frank Lopez or myself, please do not hesitate to email them to me and mbuckner at bucknersportslaw.com, and we will address those questions during our final question and answer session, which will occur after uh, Frank's uh, next presentation. And, now we're going to turn uh, to Frank. Uh, uh, yes. I was going to jump right into it. Thank you. No problem. And, and, Frank, and, uh, Frank uh, uh, we're, we're going to go into uh, looking at your extensive experience in corporate compliance matters. Uh, and, and if you could, based upon your experience as a, with the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, referencing corporate corporations and making sure that they stay out of federal trouble, could you share with us some concepts, strategies, and best practices used by corporations throughout the world that could that help minimize liability and fraud and, co and corruption matters that could possibly be adopted by NCA member institutions to address some of the issues and concerns from the FBI and uh, federal prosecution. Yeah, thank you, Michael. And um, in addition to all the terrific ideas that uh, Michael has suggested, uh, my focus is in um, helping to avoid criminal prosecution of individuals um, and um, to a lesser, there's a lesser extent of a risk of an institution being prosecuted in, in this setting. Um, but um, there's also the um, key objective of helping to uh, protect the brand. And so in uh, the corporate setting world, probably the most analogous uh, risk that uh, companies deal with in the, United, in the United States relates to bribery of government officials and more specifically uh, foreign government officials. In fact, uh, there's a uh, longstanding law adopted uh, post uh, a federal investigation known as ABSCAM um, back in the mid-70s, and that law is known as the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And under that particular law, a uh, business, uh, that is the business entity itself, as well as the individuals involved in the criminal conduct uh, that uh, provide anything of value to a foreign government official to obtain or retain business uh, are subject to prosecution under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Uh, it's a big challenge for uh, companies. Uh, companies that do business globally, uh, they send their uh, sales force um, overseas to make contact, and in many uh, countries, um, it's former government officials that are the point of contact. And it's not uncommon for individuals uh, in, in various uh, places uh, uh, based on custom and practice to ask for something uh, in order to facilitate uh, a business transaction. Well, um, that runs afoul of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, and companies, practically speaking, don't have the ability to um, be the policeman at the elbow and monitor their sales uh, staff and their agents across the globe. And so it's a very perplexing problem, and it has very serious uh, ramifications. Um, if you look at over the past uh, decade, uh, the United States Department of Justice um, has, um, in collaboration with the SEC, 
uh, recovered um, hundreds of millions of dollars of fines um, from uh, companies uh, found to have uh, violated this law and uh, incarcerated individuals um, that were uh, essentially involved in the bribery activity. So it's a big issue. And so some of the things that um, keep uh, corporate uh, ethics officers and general counsel up at night is, you know, what can you do? You know, fortunately, uh, the Justice Department has provided um, guidance, if you will, and a terrific example is in an investigation involving the Morgan Stanley uh, Financial Institution. And in that particular case, uh, there were allegations around a, a very senior level individual who was working overseas in Hong Kong um, who purportedly was paying bribes to government officials there in connection with real estate transactions. And again, a, a corporation, much like a university, can only act through its employees and its agents. And so um, on its face, the corporation was on the hook for this behavior and was facing very, very uh, significant um, impact in terms of fines, in terms of what it meant to its stock, and so forth. But um, thankfully, uh, they had been proactive. And uh, much like uh, the many things that uh, Michael suggested already, among other things, and as observed by the Justice Department and lauded by the Justice Department, uh, they had issued numerous trainings. They had issued numerous communications about doing business the right way and conducting themselves with integrity. And um, they had uh, required um, their employees to certify compliance. And so um, given all that, what the Justice Depar uh, Department decided to do in that particular case is say, you know what, you guys uh, deserve credit and uh, you guys have done what you could, practically speaking, and so we're going to focus instead on the individual wrongdoer, um, which is, at the end of the day, um, the just thing to do. And so in that regard, when I'm counseling uh, corporate clients in uh, this space, um, among other things, uh, I also I'm a big proponent of uh, certifications. And um, as we're all aware, um, in the NCAA environment, uh, there's the annual certification that occurs. In uh, the publicly traded corporation environment, um, for best practices, uh, we encourage uh, certifications to occur on a more than annual basis. Um, and for example, uh, I've worked with and been in organizations where it was required on a quarterly basis, at least at certain levels um, with respect to more senior level individuals. And they're specifically being called out to confirm that they haven't uh, provided, uh, they haven't violated certain laws or that they haven't provided an improper gratuity. Um, and that's something that um, would be adoptable to your environment. And I would encourage, uh, if you're going to go down that path, to make sure that um, you work with counsel and you develop language that is not going to be something that somebody can easily skirt. You know, again, at the end of the day, somebody could lie. But what this is about is demonstrating your due diligence, both um, to the federal government, to the state government, uh, should there be a prosecution or investigation, and obviously to the NCAA. Um, in addition to that, um, I'm also a big proponent of uh, climate surveys and uh, having a robust exit interview process um, because uh, through those efforts, you encourage individuals on a periodic basis um, to share information that you may not otherwise um, be privy to. Again, it's just another key step in your due diligence. And um, in addition to uh, those things, um, most um, large institutions, uh, particularly in the corporate world, and, 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 and I suspect, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm aware in the uh, university world as well, uh, more and more involved um, with the assistance of their internal audit department in an annual risk assessment process. And the question that uh, presents, and really that's just, um, you know, it's not unlike going to the doctor every year and having a physical and um, looking at, uh, you know, the high risk areas, uh, lungs, heart, et cetera, well, um, you know, adapt that to your environment. And we now have a new high-risk environment, um, and that is uh, with the prospect of coaches in a clandestine way providing um, improper or facilitating improper payments. And so as part of the annual risk assessment, uh, the question presents, what can you do to ferret out that behavior 
um, and, um, and, and identify those risks because um, at the end of the day, this behavior is driven by greed and in uh, many ways, <laughs> greed is the mother of ingenuity and once you think you've put your finger on one um, scheme, there's another scheme to be found and it's that sort of annual proactive thinking that occurs looking at um, for example, what's happening out in, um, you know, in, in the environment, if you will, much like this particular case, looking at what you hear about in investigations uh, at both uh, the state and federal level criminally, NCAA levels, um, looking at um, you know, what are some of the trends in litigation, and just trying to figure out a way to get ahead of potential problems and then go in and either through an investigation or through an audit, uh, structure it in a way to get at the facts uh, that can help you mitigate those risks. So those are just a few of the things that are, uh, uh, that occur in the corporate uh, setting, if you will, that I think are also uh, can be uh, adopted and adapted for the um, university environment. Frank, I appreciate that, uh, your recommendations and your overview of that. Um, looking at, uh, since you've been through the enforcer process, uh, you know, with a, a coach, and uh, you had that corporate background, and you've, you're aware of the FBI investigation. What what strikes you? Um, just what's the first few things that, that come away from you as you're reading the summary of what's going on in college basketball, and what the FBI found allegedly, and what the U.S. Attorney's Office is is, is alleging uh, these individuals did. Yeah, you know. I, I, you know, unfortunately, as a former state and federal prosecutor and with family and law enforcement, I have a bit of a jaundiced view and of, of uh, my worldview is a little jaundiced, if you will. And so I, I can't say that I'm surprised by any of this. Um, again, I mean, at the, you know, if, if you look at the adults, um, their behavior is uh, driven by greed. Um, I would suspect that with some of the student athletes, uh, the behavior may be driven by poverty. And um, or you know certainly uh, coming from an economically disadvantaged uh, place, and um, so it's uh, in many ways it's predictable. Um, I think what surprised me was that you have as high profile of an office as the U.S. Attorney's Office in the District of New York, uh, which is one of the premier offices. They are the trendsetters for federal prosecutions. Um, that um, they got involved um, with this. And uh, it was, we're talking about, at least from reported um, information, an extensive over two-year investigation. So you're talking about significant government resources uh, to go after um, this, uh, this behavior. And, um, but what perhaps makes this um, unique for me is the fact that um, allegedly you have a uh, a well-known business, a terrific brand, and um, its um, agent um, allegedly involved in, in this behavior, driving this behavior, funding this uh, behavior, and um, it's, it's that collaboration, if you will. And um, I would expect, again, that we're going to see more um, from a criminal prosecution standpoint because uh, that is uh, loss of liberty. There's loss of livelihood, if you will, at the NCA level, but loss of liberty is uh, perhaps an even greater deterrent. And, and Frank, if, if a NCAA member institution called you up today and said, Frank Lopez, we want to hire you as our chief compliance officer. We want you to make sure that uh, nothing like uh, that happens here on, on our campus. What would be, and this is for the benefit of the compliance officers on the call, Based on your experience, what would be the first few things that you'd be doing on day one or the first week to address some of the uh, issues uh, that we're finding from the FBI investigation and the federal prosecution? You know, I, you know, I would start by asking the question about, okay, what's the current state at, at this point in time in terms of what have we done by way of building a compliance program? What do we have in place by way of the elements the, at the end of the day, what we're talking about are internal controls. And um, the list of additional internal controls uh, that uh, you uh, noted earlier, uh, Michael, those are um, terrific. Um, but I'd want to know, uh, kind of get uh, the background, what's the history, 
um, what are some of the prior allegations, uh, how were those addressed, what's the current state, and um, you know, pretty much uh, doing the evaluation and then deciding, okay, where are my gaps, and how do I do a further gap assessment, um, stated differently, risk assessment to identify those gaps so that I can proactively develop a mitigation plan. Again, uh, we're going to come up in a few minutes with our last question and answer session. If you have any questions for Frank Lopez or myself, please email uh, those questions to me at mbuckner at bucknersportslaw.com. Uh, Frank, um, I mentioned earlier um, about when I had my conversations with, with college coaches that, that I know, and um, they all talked about relationships. The key is these relationships uh, between the high-profile athlete and all the third parties involved. Um, in your experience, again, as a U.S. Uh, attorney and, and dealing with corporate compliance, how do you, how do you address that relationship issue, uh, especially in the, in the realm of fraud and corruption? How do you address it from a, from a compliance standpoint? That not necessarily not all relationships are bad, but you have to monitor the relationships so they don't uh, begin to uh, involve illegal or illicit activities. Yeah, and, and so there are several things that you can do. And, and you know, at the end of the day, this is, um, you know, in many ways more art than science. But, you know, among other uh, things, you know, setting the right tone, um, so-called tone at the top and the tone at the middle and throughout, and reminding um, your stewards, if you will, your, co your coaches, um, that um, we do um, things the right way. We do things with integrity and um, making sure that that's part of the communication with the prospective student athlete from day one. That's a big part, and that's something that um, those companies that are um, engaged in best practices do in corporate America. You know, one of the other uh, internal controls or tools that are used in uh, corporate America vis-a-vis uh, -vis dealing with uh, government officials and um, and this applies both at the state and, and you know, an overseas level. Um, at each state and also at local levels, there are limits around what sorts of gratuities can be provided to a government official. You run afoul of that, and it's typically um, a criminal violation. And uh, some jurisdictions have very, very draconian laws. And so one of the things that I've uh, developed and helped uh, clients implement is a, uh, literally a pre-approval process where before they're going to uh, offer, and I stress, the mere offer of anything of value uh, to a government official, uh, they have to pre-clear that. And it sounds onerous, um, you know, but I did that in the environment of a uh, Fortune 200 with 50,000 employees, and at the end of the day, it uh, really was not as cumbersome as one might expect, because part of what that also forces is reminds them of good behavior, and um, it reminds, again, stresses the tone of integrity, and it, it causes them to stop and think. Um, and you know, one, one uh, other thought on this is, look, at the end of the day, um, it, at least in the criminal realm, we're not talking strict liability. Um, it's what are you doing by way of due diligence as an organization to minimize these risks and drive the right behaviors. Um, because um, you know, individuals that are bent on uh, greed and violating policy and the law will try to find a way to skirt it. Um, but um, what matters uh, from a liability standpoint and also significantly from a brand protection standpoint, the court of public opinion, what was the institution, what was the leadership, what was the head coach doing to help prevent this behavior? Again, we're going to be in a few minutes going to our third and last question and answer session. If you have any questions or if you want to provide us with what you're doing on your campus, any new strategies, best practices, techniques uh, that you're implementing on your campus you want to share with everyone on the call, again, please don't hesitate to email those to me at mbuckner at bucknersportslaw.com. That's mbuckner at bucknersportslaw.com. Uh, Frank, I just want to touch on uh, one thing. I know some people on this call may, may be thinking, you know, um, why do we need to implement a corporate compliance techniques to uh, athletic context? I mean, is there really a need to, you know, adapt uh, what corporations are doing in terms of their compliance programs to the university context? Aren't we dealing with two different 
uh, entities in two different contexts, and 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 yeah, there, there may be some bad apples out there, but we really don't have to go that extra step doing what U.S. corporations are doing in terms of compliance. If, if there are some those sentiments out there, how would you address that in light of what's been going on in the last few weeks? You know, Michael, that's a terrific question. And um, you know, it wasn't that long ago when uh, corporate America was thinking that way. I'll be honest with you, there's still a lot of corporate America that asks that question, why do we have to spend all these resources? And then uh, the parade of horribles occurs and um, you know, they understand. Um, but um, I mean, literally, these practices have only uh, really been in place, and they flow from the United States Sentencing Guidelines, Chapter 8, which sets forth and defines uh, the elements of an effective compliance program, um, which um, didn't issue uh, before the early 90s. And think back to um, Enron and WorldCom and some of those other organizations, um, and it was uh, sort of that flood of uh, criminal conduct and um, people that uh, were terribly impacted um, that uh, caused uh, regulators, legislators, uh, prosecutors to stand up, take attention, and um, take action. And um, you know, one of the ways is by bringing prosecutions. And I think I would submit that based on what we've seen here, we're on the front end in, in this environment, in the NCAA environment, of this sort of uh, prosecution and government uh, regulatory activity, much like uh, 17 years ago with Enron, we were on the front end in corporate America. And so I would uh, I'd just suggest um, um, if, uh, if not for you know, self-interest uh, from the standpoint uh, of good stewards and protecting uh, the brand, um, that there are, you know, everything that um, you know, corporate America is doing in this realm is obviously not uh, transferable and, and not practical. But look at their hard lessons and what can you take away um, and what are some of these uh, internal controls that uh, I've referenced, that you've referenced, that from a practical standpoint can be implemented to help mitigate risk. Again, all we're talking about is risk mitigation and we're never going to operate, nor should we, in an environment where the um, objective is a um, zero uh, risk uh, tolerance, um, to be contrasted from a zero tolerance for certain types of violations, of course. But we're talking about what are some of the practical internal controls, cost-effective internal controls, get, that can be put in place to best position the university and its leadership to say, hey, look, um, we did uh, we exercised due diligence, we've adopted best practices, we did what was practically available to us to avoid this behavior, and your focus should be on uh, the individual that didn't uh, leverage or take advantage of this message and chose to engage in criminal conduct. And, and Frank, my last question for me, and again, if anyone has any questions for Frank or myself, you can email them to uh, mbuckner at bucknersportsalt.com. Um, in the corporate context, if a corporation was going to be uh, prosecuted by the U.S. government for various fraud, fraudulent or, corp or, um, or corruption matters, what type of evidence uh, would a or could a corporation present that could demonstrate that uh, that they have a uh, full-fledged, uh, robust, uh, functioning compliance program. And I want you to answer that question in the context of, you know, this is what we would do in the corporate setting, and hey, NCA member institutions, here's some ideas that you can use in, in the NCA context in light of what's been going on with the FBI investigation. Yeah, that's a terrific question, and again, a question that um, post-Enron um, companies have been asking themselves. Unfortunately, there are a number of companies that uh, don't bother and uh, do face the full weight of uh, the, the government's prosecutions at the federal and state levels. But, you know, among other things, um, and, and let me also add that uh, just within the past couple of years, um, the DOJ put in place what is essentially a corporate compliance czar. Um, because what will happen is, not unlike uh, the NCAA um, environment, where there's um, an investigation and there are allegations of criminal conduct, um, and ideally pre-indictment, um, 
the company will go to the federal prosecutor with um, counsel and kind of lay out, look, these are all the things that we did um, to avoid um, this occurrence, and these are the reasons why we should not be prosecuted. Um, and, and so among other things, um, the, some of the internal controls that you've referenced, but from the corporate setting, again, these are found in Chapter 8 of the Federal Sentencing Guidelines. And among other things, it speaks to, first of all, is there high-level um, oversight of the compliance program um, stated differently? Um, is the board involved in uh, supporting and uh, monitoring uh, the compliance program? Um, is there a uh, code of conduct? Are employees being properly trained in terms of what is expected of them? Um, is there monitoring and auditing to look for noncompliance proactively? Um, is there, once there is, um, well, first uh, and foremost, is there a means by which um, individuals can report anonymously concerns, uh, hotline? Um, and once there have been issues raised, um, how does the organization respond to those issues? What do they do to address um, allegations? Um, what do they do to quickly uh, mitigate harm um, and um, ensure that the behavior is not going to be repeated. Um, those are some of the elements of a, uh, an effective corporate compliance program. Um, again, at uh, the end of the day, it, it starts with uh, the tone at the top and the tone at the middle, and uh, that's something that uh, compliance professionals can help uh, foster and ensure that um, it remains uh, front and center. Thank you, Frank. I appreciate that. Before we proceed to our last question and answer session, I want to remind you Buckner conducts complimentary webinars throughout the year for you and your staff. For our attorney participants, most of the monthly programs have received continuing legal education credits for, from at least one state bar association. The list of currently scheduled programs is listed, uh, will be listed on our website at bucknersportshall.com. You can view the video of this webinar and other Buckner online workshops on our website, bucknersportslaw.com, or on our YouTube platform. Just search for Michael Buckner Law. Finally, for a reasonable fee, you can request a Buckner professional to conduct a, uh, a, to conduct a program on a topic of your choice on your campus through the, through the firm's campus speaker series. For more information on this service, please contact us at 954-941-1844. We will start our third and final question and answer session now. If you have any questions, please email those questions to me at mbuckner at bucknersportslaw.com. That's mbuckner at bucknersportslaw.com. And while we're waiting for if anyone has any final questions, uh, Frank, is there any additional information that you'd like to share with the uh, participants on the call? Uh, you know, in the, the, the challenge is, and again, the challenge I think arises uh, both in, uh, in the corporate setting as I'd imagine uh, the university and uh, college institution setting. And you know, the folks uh, that took uh, time out of their busy schedules to listen to this get it, are committed to it, and the challenge is demonstrating the value proposition of these programs, these internal controls. Um, and uh, again, keeping it front and center because it's like any other um, catastrophe, if you will. Um, everybody sort of pays attention uh, for a week or two, and at that point in time, uh, that's when you should be asking for resources, by the way. Um, at that point in time, it's, it's easier to get resources, um, but you know, as time passes, um, there's uh, lots of interest and so forth. Um, and so that's the real challenge is uh, to keep um, these issues uh, front and center and fresh uh, throughout um, so that um, you can get the support and resources that you need uh, to, to create uh, a robust uh, and continue with a robust program. Thank you, Frank. I appreciate it. Uh, there are no questions uh, presented. Uh, again, if you have any questions after the program, you can email those to us at mbuckner at bucknersportslaw.com. Before we conclude the program, I would like to invite you to share your comments and input on today's program by completing the email to us, the evaluation form, which you will receive in your post-webinar packet. Thank you for your participation in today's web roundtable. We look forward to your, to your participation during our next event. 
which will be listed on our website, bucknersportslaw.com. So be on the lookout for the announcement. Thanks again, and this concludes our session. Thank you, Michael.